All right. So today, episode six, what is it? So we're starting episodes, we're starting with the 52 weeks of episode six. It's called Wiring Your Reef Tank, Everything You Forgot to Think About. And we have a core belief, and this one is true. I mean, I, I, raise your hand oh. if your first tank was called a rat's nest. Oh, 100%. Uh, actually, you know what we called it here? Cord octopus disaster. <laughs> and it like pretty much uh, sums it all up, right? Yeah. Okay, so this is the core belief. What everything uh, you'll hear today kind of sums up and builds into. Mm. Clean is synonymous with safe. Yes. I, and end of story. If you go look at it and you cannot see a cord and everything's managed really well and it just looks super clean, bet you it's safe too. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a loophole in there somewhere if you wanted to go looking for it, but I would say 99% of the time, if you go look at it and say, man, that looks clean, it's inherently safe. It's inherently well. safe. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, what matters most in terms of wiring your tank, uh, everything you forgot to think about, number one? Uh, what we believe matters most, uh, first thing is the amp capacity. And I don't know how many times I've plugged in, you know, a power strip or a whole bunch of different things on, like I got a, you know, an L-shaped corner in my house. I've got some outlets over here and I got some outlets over here. We kind of spread them out and then go to turn a light on or turn a heater on or something kicks on and poof, everything dies. It's like, well, everything on that, those two walls were tied to the same 15 amp fuse. Uh, do you really think that one 15 amp fuse can handle the entire tank? No. But you uh, you solved it in your own house. Well, yeah, I put it in a whole bunch of circuits. Uh, <laughs> it can though. Uh, so, but just think about it. Like, yeah. uh, how many watts is each one of these things? And kind of like think about it. Like, well, what if they were all on what would at happen, the exact right? same time? Yeah. And like, what happens? Like, what else is on that circuit? Like, what if it's plugged into my entertainment system and I decide mm -hmm. to like mm -hmm. jam some Jimi Hendrix? Uh, <laughs> you know, what will happen then? Uh, and so. Yeah, amp capacity, and you don't want to like ride the you know the the, no. the edge just because it doesn't turn off. Because eventually, like let's say you had a 15 amp and you were running 17 amps through it and it didn't trigger. Uh, well, a there's a little bit of safety issue there, but mm -hmm. b someday it's probably going to flip and it will happen when some lights or something turns on and yeah. you're not around. You might not be around. Yeah. So think about the amp capacity, and there's a lot of ways that you can do that. You can fix that. Uh, one, uh, if it happens to be on a circuit, there's other stuff. Well, maybe you could run, you know, your entertainment system off of a different plug, mm -hmm. right? Or maybe when you add, like, you got to think about it. Can I add a new outlet some way without like destroying my You're house? ripping up the walls and yeah. all that other stuff. Yeah. You, usually, it's going underneath the floor is mm -hmm. probably the best way in a basement or crawl space and popping it up. Uh, but you know, there's two ways to do it. Can I get it to where the tank is? Uh, or can I put the tank somewhere there's already multiple? Would that be yeah, a better idea? Split between a few breakers. But what if I can just put another, like, what if I can't get to where the tank is? What if I can put another outlet where the home entertainment is? You know, then, then I can pull that off of it. Yeah, yeah. And then also, like, don't plug your vacuum into that outlet. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, I don't know. Uh, that's one of the things to really think about to begin with is uh, amp capacity. And... You know, sound, putting a new uh, outlet in your house sounds expensive, but if you, mm. you know, find the right guy to do it, it isn't really as expensive as it sounds. Or in, in most cases, if you just ask your friend circle, somebody will probably know how to do it, yeah. actually. So uh, go ahead. Well, I mean, this all goes back to higher paths of success here is, what, is why we believe this stuff matters the most. And mm -hmm. second one, next one up that matters the most uh, leads you to a higher path of success in reefing. Everything needs to be removed at some point. Like yesterday, we told you that every piece of gear fails. Everything will fail, but even more so in a saltwater environment. Here's the next part of that. Uh, your wiring and everything you forgot about, well, when you forgot that you zip tied 100 different points of your cord's nest all the way through so it looks really clean, guess what happens when that skimmer pump or that one pump fails uh, or breaks or you need to take something out for maintenance? I have to go and clip all of those little things, trace the thing all the way back, and then uh, clean it and then put it all back to where it was. There's better options out there. Zip ties, dead to me. Don't use them. I'll never use zip ties Don't again. use them. Velcro. Uh, even the ones that are like kind of allow you to open and close, they yeah. tend to fail. Uh, and so I, I would never ever use zip ties again because what happens is 
the first time you set it up with zip ties, it will look It ridiculous. looks great. It looks oh, beautiful. Man. You've hidden everything really, really well. One solid snake. Yep. yep. Uh, you got a bunch of zip ties going down and it just looks clean. really, really clean, right? Uh, but then one day you're like, oh, you know what? My power monitor is telling me to clean my return pump, but F no. <laughs> uh, you know, there's no way, man. I'm going to cut that all apart. Mm. Okay, so uh, what I use now is exclusively is like little zip. I've tried the little like round clippies that stick on. Anything that like requires a adhesive pops off Terrible over time. Terrible in salt water, yeah. Yeah. So what I do now is just uh, these zip or there's strips. Velcro strips. Yeah, there's a little strip and... Um, uh, it, there's a, a little hole to, in the top of the tab, and so all you do is you know wrap it around your cords, run it through the hole, tighten it up, and zip tie it. I mean, it's seconds to put on and seconds to take off. Some of them also have like a little uh, tab on the end that you can screw into into the yeah. uh, wood mm -hmm. or whatever, so that it actually does hold it in place as well. It's really nice. Sometimes you need to use a little washer or something to make sure it doesn't go through. But it, Velcro uh, or I don't know, any kind of hook and loop type thing. I wonder if we should I wonder if we should look into sourcing these for the website just because they're that that great. I mean you can you find what, you can yeah. find them anywhere, but you know convenience. There's a bunch of stuff that we carry that you can find anywhere too, but that type of thing is always always cheaper at like a Home Depot, but maybe convenience. Uh, yeah. it'll be a dollar more expensive here. Yeah. I don't know, we'll see. Uh, uh, all right. So the adaptive reef boxes are both clean and safe. And so the adaptive reef boxes, you see them in our normal videos. Like mm -hmm. it has the apex and the little monitor and the outlets and everything. Part of it's just bling. You can use them for anything. It doesn't have to be like branded stuff, mm -hmm. but get, getting your gear up and off of the ground and with drip loops and nice and neat, uh, that's one of the best ways to get it done. Yeah, so you by far don't need a box, man, to make no. this happen. But like, here's the thing, is like you're gonna have a massive amount of power bricks, massive. you're gonna have all of these cords, mm -hmm. and they gotta go somewhere. You know, where are they all gonna go? Is it gonna be a big pile in your sump? Or can I put them inside of a box? And then like, not only will it look cleaner, uh, but it's also going to be safer because the water isn't going to travel down the cords in the same way when yep. you have it all routed in there. Yeah. So adaptive reef boxes, uh, I would say, you know, it's one of those things that doesn't sell really well because you don't, you can't really visualize. You see this black box and you're like, well, what would I do with what it? What would I do with that? And it's funny because then we, I told the team the other day to like go gray out what the apex looks like on it. And then uh, they all sold in the same day. Once you have the <laughs> inspiration of what you're going to do with it. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, all right. So uh, another one is the power supply brackets are best. So mm. uh, there, you can get a bunch of these. You can get them. Basically, they are just like a, a little clip that goes on the outside of your power block or there's, bar. There's people know. that I think there's... Uh, you, 3D printed versions. Uh, there's you know, in 3D printed. No, yeah. there's 3D printed instructions for you to print your own. Uh, one of the, I mean, once we found Ecotex and used Ecotex that fit every, every size power brick you could imagine uh, and how easy they are. They already got sticky tape on the back. So once you tighten it, everything up, you put it on there and now it's stuck to the wall and you can drill it in. So easy. So let me give you an idea. We don't have a picture of this. So let me give you an idea of what you're talking about. So everybody has a whole bunch of those like a, you know, DC power adapter blocks, right? Yep. Yep. Big uh, and they usually just sit all over the ground. They're little cord freeways because where else are you going to put them, right? Uh, these things are just little metal brackets that go on the ends of your, you know, power block, yeah. right? Uh, and they have little hooks on them and go around the edges and the Velcro on them. What's kind of cool though about these ones specifically, actually, can you pull that picture up, Yeah, Dave? All right, sweet. He's gonna have a picture of this in a second. So what it allows you to do is mount, you know, all six or all 10 of them, all linear, really clean, really easy. You can zip tie, or not zip tie, uh, Velcro the, the cords along with it. And what's cool about them, the most thing is when you said, is there's little stickers in the back Yep. So you can put it on there, Velcro it, stick it to the wall, un-Velcro it, take it off, and then put the screws in, and it's always perfect every time. Yeah, because otherwise, uh, you who knows if you're straight, uh, if it's square, you know, all this other stuff here. 
Okay, so that's what it looks like. Hey, these things, if you're worried about wiring your tank, uh, everything you forgot to think about, you forgot to think about these. <laughs> uh, you know, they're they're you know these ones are I guess 18 bucks a piece. Uh, you can For find 3D printed ones. I don't know if they'll have the sticker, and they'll obviously be plastic instead of metal. But uh, there are cheaper versions of this. I won't do a tank without these things mm. now. Uh, like I need everything well, put away, has a home, and easy to remove Velcro straps. And in especially when you use them in uh, adaptive reef boxes that we just talked about, and you put them, you can take the back side of the adaptive reef box or the front side off, mount all of these power bricks, and then uh, plug everything in and make all the cords really nice. And everything goes back into that adaptive reef box so, so smooth. You, if you have the patience and the time to do it, makes it safe and easy. Next one, we're violating right behind us, but I'll share the wisdom behind it anyway. The which water? Is avoid 110. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah, there's another one there. Avoid 110 over the tank. Right, yeah. so that's a 110 volt uh, gonna kill you uh, electrical so, supply above the tank. So think, thinking about this isn't like avoid having lights over your tank because uh, you know, most of these lights are DC, so they get to the AC transferred into DC. So that's not 110 watts at the plug-in of the Kessels or the Ecotex or the you know the Neptunes and stuff like that. This is having uh, something that doesn't have a power brick or a D it's not DC powered or what have you. That is straight 110 from the wall over the over the tank. Uh, What's the so, DC stuff? If it fell in the tank, it wouldn't electrocute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the 110, does, you will fry. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what we're what we're violating it here is these. Uh, um, what are these? The T5. Uh, yeah, the T5 uh, hybrid type adaptive or uh, add-on kits. Mm -hmm. That is straight 110 to those T5 lamps. So there was a world in the past with halides and T5s where you always had to have 110. It, just the way it was. I was like, I had a close call with this at one point in time. Uh, I dropped, I had a PC bulb over a, that big frag tank mm. in my basement and the cheap little Coralife uh, plastic legs on there snapped while I had my hands in the tank and the whole thing fell in. I thought I was dead <laughs> and I was like, well, why am I not electrocuted? And it's because I had a dry lock floor down. And so I had like these uh, rubber uh, oh, yeah. uh, thing through the floor and then it had plywood on top of it and uh, there was no ground and I was wearing shoes and stuff too. So I just happened to not be grounded when it happened. Whew. But if I was, dude, I wouldn't be here talking to you. So uh, if, if you can, I would say, Either respect the fact that you have 110 over the tank. Do whatever it takes to make sure that that cord is solid up above the tank. And if it were to come disconnected, it will not fall. Like zip tie it, do whatever it takes to keep that, that power up above the water. I, I, now that I know what I know, I'd be a little less comfortable even using those toggle bolts in the ceiling with 110 mm. over the tank. If I know I'm gonna have my hands in it, I mean, it's just drywall between me and dying. Yeah. Uh, and so <laughs> if you're screwing it into a stud, but the chances the studs are spaced evenly, I guess you could put up actually a little bit of a- Crossbar. You could put a crossbar, mm. like a decorative bar on the ceiling and then screw into that and then into the studs. But, you know, think about 110. Uh, I, I will say there's a, there's actually a, a you, know, you think of like, well, LEDs are all safe then because they all have those power blocks. It's not true. There's a, a lot of cheaper LEDs where the There's power no power brick is actually inside the light. Yeah. So if, if yours just has a cord that goes right to the wall to the wall, that means you have one ten over straight the tank. to it. So just think about it uh, and <clears throat> either avoid it if you can or respect it if you can't. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, speaking of water and electricity, here's a uh, what we believe matters most in everything you forgot about wiring your reef tank. Water doesn't travel up. I mean, in some cases it Sometimes can wick. Sometimes it wicks, it would, yeah. But not up a cord. Not up a cord into the outlet and through, no, so. And yeah, like some kind of fibrous material maybe it could, but yeah. in a vast majority of cases, water doesn't travel up, which is, you know, when I when I do a drip loop on a cord, uh, I'll just throw this mic up here, hopefully I don't make a bunch of noise with it. Uh, <laughs> right now, if it, if water hit it, it would just travel down this like a freeway. It yep. would just stick to it and go right into the outlet. However, if I put a little loop in it, it will just drip and fall right off the bottom there. Mm. And so 
the drip loop thing is important. And like sometimes you have it actually as a coil to make sure. Sometimes it, it's just a little bit of a bend. But the bend, you know, you should, you know, attach it to the wall in that bend or it won't keep that bend, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, or, you know, often like with those, like those, uh, you know, adaptive brief boxes by sending them up through the bottom or just mounting, you know, uh, the, the power bar above the sump in most cases will actually force the cords in the sump to like go upward yeah. rather than downward. Yeah. So just think about that. And when you're installing all of your gear, the water generally doesn't travel up and you can solve a lot of safety stuff just by considering that. Yeah, you know, I would, uh, if I were to, you know, go down that path of building another tank at home or what have you, I would actually personally just uh, move my outlets for the tank uh, up to about three feet, four feet high, which helps you force you into a drip loop because I'm not sending my power straight down from here. Uh, absolutely. If you're going to put in a new outlet, uh, the outlet can actually be Make it higher. a little taller, yeah. yeah. Hmm. All right. Uh, another one is uh, spread the load. Uh, <laughs> and so that could be either in your power bars. It could be in the Apex uh, EB32, yeah. EB832. Uh, it could be anything. Like So if I have, you know two heaters that are both 600 watts, well, plug them into different things. Right. Don't put them all in the same outlet. Yeah, you know? yeah. uh, and, and note that a lot of the outlets that are designed to turn on and off, you know, like a, you know, a controller, like you definitely don't want to like plug two of them into one, you know, like 1200 watts, it is going to chew through the electronics in that outlet much, much, much faster <laughs> than if you had split it up into two. Yeah. Oh, I, I've, I learned that one the hard way uh, by constantly flip, uh, breaking breakers into the point or flipping breakers into the point where I like had an electric, uh, just an extension cord running from another side of the room underneath through the car or underneath the carpet back over. And probably that, that comes back to some of these, uh, uh, being safe and clean and whatnot, that was definitely not safe. The next one here is the kilowatt. I don't know if anybody knows what a kilowatt is, but it's just this little, like, I don't know, $20 or so box. Do we sell the kilowatt here? Uh, yeah, maybe we'll find a picture yeah, of it, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, the, the kilowatt thing actually monitors the amount of power that you're consuming yep. here. Yeah, that guy right there. It's 22 bucks. Uh, and so I would call it uh, what, what we believe matter most is the kilowatt is more than a nice to have. All you gotta do is plug your power bar in there or a specific pro, uh, or a piece of gear and you'll find out immediately how much draw a juice you're actually pulling out of that outlet, right? Okay, you can find out, you know, like we talked about it yesterday that you could, you know, monitor your performance of your pumps this way. Uh -huh. But also I can plug my whole power bar into this thing and find out with everything on, What's the what's, total amount of juice yeah, that I'm using? What's it drawn? Then you know, like, ah, it's too much, or it's right on that razor's edge. Let's split some of these off. So what a lot of people are doing is plugging it all in, and if it didn't trigger my breaker, I must be safe, <laughs> that's, right? That's bad. But if you know that your breaker is 15 amps and this thing says 16, even though the breaker isn't tripping, it just hasn't tripped yet, right? <laughs> uh, and so you should really think about uh, one of these things, 22 bucks, you can actually find out how much power. It's great for maintenance. And you know mm -hmm. we've mentioned uh, many times that as you, if you have a 30 watt pump, if it's dirty, despite what you might think, you'd think that it'd be harder for the little turbine to spin uh, and may to suck up more power. Actually, when it's dirty, it spins slower and sucks up less power, mm -hmm. right? So you'll know uh, on that front. But uh, kilowatt is partially about safety. It's partially like knowing what you're doing and you can start to do it intelligently at that point as well. Uh, another what we believe matters most here, if, if it's possible to happen, it will happen. We, uh, we talked again, we talked about uh, this one uh, a little bit yesterday in that uh, redundant tank and redundant tank safety. And it just take that, it's that taking that time to figure out, you know, if this happens, then what? Well, same thing here with power and wiring your tank. Like if water were to travel down that cord, would it be safe? And you look at it and you go, yeah, but it's not traveling down the cord now. No, but if it could happen, 
it will happen eventually. Yeah, long enough timeline, you're just waiting. You're just waiting for the time bomb. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Like uh, I've seen this many times where, uh, it, you know, you had the old days, you had a, like a little clamp on light for a refugium ball. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Clamp it right on your sump or on right the, top the top of something. 110 sitting right over the water, <laughs> right? And the worst yet is it might fall in there and not kill everything until something else grounds it. And the thing that will ground it will be when you put your hand in the tank. <laughs> uh, oh. And so it might have fallen in there. So if it's if you're deciding that a little three dollar clamp is the thing between you dying or not dying, think again because a long enough timeline that thing's gonna fall in. <laughs> uh, also, like for me, I knew. When I put that Coral Life fixture with those super cheap legs, that thin. those legs had broken on me an unbelievable amount of times already as I was trying to pull it on and off. I uh, knew when I did it, this isn't safe. <laughs> and then sure enough, it very much wasn't. And only a couple other decisions saved my life. Yeah. So uh, think about that. If, if it's possible to happen and you're looking at it like, ah, I'll get to that later. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so hard lessons uh, learned. We actually kind of heard a couple of them already through here. But yep. Spirit of wiring your tank, everything you forgot to think about, hard lessons, don't do these. Hard lesson number one, electricity outage in, in your neighborhood, uh, a breaker or an outlet or a power bar. They will happen and uh, you should be prepared for it. Yeah, when you think of electricity outage, it's not it, just like, it's not just the power grid in your neighborhood failed. Yeah. We've, we learned that here in the, We've learned this on, on all these different types of levels here in BRS, the 750XXL. Uh, it wasn't the power that went out around because all the other apexes were saying, hey, I'm good to go. It was that one GFCI outlet that flipped and luckily the warehouse was working here on the weekend. They came in and saw everything off. Yeah, so some noisy piece of equipment that was failing and the, te and the uh, system set off the breaker yep. and it was done. Uh, so yeah, when you think of power edges, don't think just about like uh, lightning struck a tree down the street uh, or somebody drove into the tree. Uh, it's the breaker, it's an outlet, it's the $3 bargain, you know, power bar. Power strip bought. thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, like, so look at the power bar and see how much power it can actually take. And if you're riding the razor's edge of the maximum amount in these things, uh, well, you're gonna get razor edge results. You know? <laughs> uh, also, uh, we said it this yesterday, low density neighborhoods are the last to get power fixed. Mm. I, I I assume this is true nationwide. It's definitely true in Minnesota, but it feels so plausible. That yeah, if the power came out and uh, you know they got to go put up wires up again, mm -hmm. and one wire will get ten thousand people's power on, and one of them will get uh, forty, they go to the ten thousand, and they'll go and so on and so on to get to forty. So if you look around your neighborhood and see like, wow, nobody lives out here but me. That's me. Uh, you're last. <laughs> You might be out for uh, days I'm rather than hours uh, in many cases. <laughs> so the power solution, backup solution should match mm. that. Most people that live in high density cities and stuff, your power will probably never be out for more than eight hours. Yeah. And so, you know, the solutions can match that. Mm. Mm. Well, and talk, talking about prevention, one of the hard, you know, a hard lesson to learn that you don't, that you want to prevent is uh, generators. They, they work, they work great. They only work if you uh, maintain them or if you keep up with them. Uh, how many times do you think, like back over the past five to 10 years, how many times did my power actually go out? I mean, it's probably on one hand and maybe even less than uh, one of these five fingers. And so you think, okay, well, I've had this generator. I got a generator, it's good to go. But if you're just, if it's sitting for 10 years out in your garage or in your shed or in your basement or where have you, uh, and you've never really turned that and run that thing over a couple times a year or changed the oil or what have you, or replace the gas that's in it, uh, might yes. not work when you go pull the thing. Yeah, the, if you didn't get perfect uh, uh, attention to getting all the gas and stuff out of between, it's all gonna gel in there yeah. and the carburetor's gonna yeah. be jacked. So think about it in this spirit. Or stabilize. If you have, everybody knows what it's like to own a lawnmower, a weed whacker, uh, <laughs> you know, a chainsaw. If you hadn't started one of those things uh, in five years, what are the chances that it's going to start Fire when you pull right it? Up. Mm, pretty low. Zero. <laughs> pretty right? Low. Really, like you're just going to get lucky at that point. Yeah. You had the reason that it works at, in five years from now 
is because you were meticulous about getting all of the, uh, the gas, gas out. out of it. And that means not just running it till it's empty. Most of them actually have a little screw somewhere to uh, empty the last mm -hmm. little bit out of the little carburetor bulb on yep. the bottom. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, like, otherwise it's just not gonna work. Making sure that you use stabilizer in the gas, uh, you know, as a Over last ditch. Over winter and the, uh, even, yeah. even for storage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, doing whatever you can, changing the oil. So if you're gonna buy a generator, it will only work as good as you maintain it. And that's kind of why I've never really been big on recommending people buy generators. Yeah. Is because they they only work if you care for them and most people don't have any reason to care for them. I, I, would, uh, I would offer a, an alternative type of generator uh, than just uh, gas and carbureted and things like that. Some of these propane powered generators mm. are really good these days. And propane is nice because it's a pressurized gas. So, Clearing it out, uh, I mean, you don't have to worry about this fuel tank full of fuel sitting there all, you know, for years or over the winter or what have you. You can uh, hook up, hook one up to your five gallon propane tank or what have you, run it when you need to. There's no residual gas in a tank sitting inside your generator. I would imagine that that's probably a little uh, easier to maintain. I'm, I want to research that now because yeah. I never thought about that. Yeah. That's a good point. A pro, and everybody's got a barbecue grill and five yeah. gallon tank and a propane tank there. You can go get five gallons over the gas station for 20 bucks, you know, so. Yeah, yeah so I got a whole house generator and uh, it actually runs off natural gas. Yeah. And so, you know, like you don't have to fill it with gas, but it probably doesn't have the same problems. Yeah. And yeah. it also, this one like starts itself every uh, week and has a little light on it, red or green, yeah. if, it, if it was able to start. <laughs> uh, so uh, every week I have a pulse on whether or not this thing is actually gonna work when I need it, because it runs for 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, but it requires, it's an engine, it requires oil changes like everything else. I think I'll, I think I might, uh, actually I need a propane generator. I need a generator myself just to have at my house. But uh, I think I'm gonna look into a propane one. Cause I, I saw that yesterday in some of the comments after yesterday's video and they oh, were really? like, propane tanks, propane uh, generators. Oh yeah, good idea. You know, <laughs> you learn something new every day. Uh, all right, so uh, we also, hard lesson is computer backups are mm. not as valuable as people suggest. Big, uh, we did like I, I did a three part or maybe four part investigate series, and you know we talked about uh, you brought a you brought up that you were at the store. Somebody had told you uh, to know you're getting the best uh, battery backup or UPS battery backup had to be the heaviest. And mm -hmm. So that's what we went. I went over to Micro Center and I got you know a few like sized uh, UPS battery backups, some smaller versions, and did the test and then to the biggest, heaviest ones I could get and did the test. And basically uh, found that when you plug your power head into one of these battery backups, specifically like DC power head, uh, because the, the UPS battery backup is uh, converting the AC power to DC power, back to AC power, you find that it ends up being uh, super inefficient and even like a $200, $250 bat UPS battery backup winds up only lasting you about five to six hours. Yeah, and somebody, I saw, I saw a comment in there and it kind of reiterates some of the things we've said in the past, which is a UPS battery backup for your computer is designed to provide somewhere between 500 and like 1500 watts of power yeah. uh, during a power outage to give you enough time to turn the thing off. And boot, you know? boot it down and save like, and all that other minutes. stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, what we're looking for is not 1500 watts, but like, you know, in many cases, 15 yeah. for as long as possible. And so the inverter, uh, the size of inverter that you're gonna put on something that is gonna drive 1500 watts just sucks up a lot more power than something that like 15. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. We found that you get a matter of hours out of it, but like, it's not a bad move, but also, mm. I, I don't know, you can actually get a, a a decent power head with a battery bucket backup solution and skip the $150 bad solution. So that's why I think where, it's only six hours today. A year from now, it's gonna be four and two years from now, it's gonna be two. Oh yeah, you keep them plugged in all the time and on the ready, eventually it's diminishing returns. And that's why you have to replace your UPS every so often. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. Like people said that a lot for a long time. And I guess if you happen to have one around, it's not a terrible idea, but 
the the options where you have these DC pumps now, like the Gyre and the Vortex and the Tunes is the Tunes one's cool because you can actually go buy your own battery mm -hmm. and whatever size you want. Yeah. Uh, but like those types of things, you, you know what I would really like and I, I would be really awesome is if somebody would make a battery backup for that accepts like my Dewalt battery for oh, my, my cordless that. drill and That's stuff like cool. that. Because I got cordless drills all the time. So if you can make one that's actually charging my drill thing and it just happens to, if the power goes out, it power my pumps. <laughs> but I can pull this thing off and go, you know, drill for a little bit that's and go put it back. Big, it's just a lithium ion battery. Yeah. Because yeah, that lithium, that's actually pretty expensive, the battery, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And it could run my tanks. <laughs> and the reason I got that idea actually is because our picking solution out back. Oh, yeah, they use uh, Dewalt batteries. They use Dewalt batteries because it's no, it doesn't make any sense for the, the fast fetch people that design picking software to become battery engineers. Right, right, right. You can just go buy these things at Home Depot. <laughs> and then when we run out, when they break, you just go to Home Depot, get some more, and they have charges, like a whole wall of these chargers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I don't know. I think that'd be really cool. I, I think at a, uh, you know, at a bare minimum, when we're talking about, you know, you know, protecting the tank when it comes to a battery or a, a, an outage and whatnot, I would, uh, I would probably have a, you know, I'd, at a time like, you know, Black Friday or whatever, I'd probably buy, you know, a tunes pump, uh, a cheap or one of the cheaper ones or whatever it takes. So anything with flow and that, that battery, uh, that battery one. So I can choose my own battery. I've got those little batteries with the tune safety switch connector or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've got a bunch of those little things. I have little, uh, ammo can, uh, charge boxes that I build. I have, you know, ice fishing gear that runs on those little batteries. Uh, good thing to just kind of keep around the tank in case the power goes out. If I don't have a full battery backup solution for my tank. Another hard lesson. I actually had a fire. Uh, and so I had bought a used system that had uh, halides and T5s in it, right? Mm. And I plugged it all in. Everything looked like it was running just fine. And uh, I was pleased with it. Uh, we're leaving the front door. I go to close the door and I'm like, hmm, kind of smells like smoke, man. Yeah. And like, I mean, it was like half a second from closing that door and then I would have come back to no home. Oh, you know, wow. uh, and so we went back in, and what I found was the used system I bought. The retrofit T5s were corroded uh, and shorting out uh, and creating a smoldering fire. Uh, and so, like, that is one thing I would say. Look for the, like those retrofit T5 things that are, are like. I don't know. They're not the safest things in the universe, <laughs> uh, but also. Uh, just think about specifically on used systems, especially if it's all put together and you never, you didn't have to rebuild it yourself, which mm -hmm. means you didn't actually touch and see every part. You know, actually be around for that day first off, but like think about some of that stuff because I actually almost burned down my house just by turning it on and it was that close. <laughs> uh, another hard lesson to learn about wiring your reef tank and what you forgot. Too many things into one single power bar or power strip or any one of those things. Like, you know, you go buy your strip uh, like this, uh, one of those long skinny ones, and you jam everything. It's got like five or six outlets and you try to jam everything into one of those little plugs. Um, yeah, that, unsafe. And actually, I've popped so many of the, I've popped many of those before trying to do that same thing. And not only that, but sometimes you get the uh, you know like your tunes oscillator uh, plug in has a little roundiness to it, and so you got to jam that in there, and then you kind of got to bend it a little bit to get the next plug to fit. And you're just now you're exposing prongs, and I've done all of that before. And in hindsight, way unsafe. So there's some things in this series you're going to hear us say more than once because they fit in different places. But when I feel the need to say them again, it's because that's the level of importance, right? Yeah. And here is one. Uh, a hard lesson. Uh, I guess I haven't read, had this one hard, but I don't want to, and I don't yeah. want you to have it either, which is if you have a power bar or an EB832 or a controller outlet or anything, if you have them sitting on the ground with the cords coming out of them, mm -hmm. not for a single minute, not for another hour, go fix that. 
today because it is going to be a problem for you someday and it could be catastrophic. So if you have a power bar sitting on the ground with cords, little freeways of water going down into it, just go get the two screws and mount it to the side of the stand today. Yeah. Uh, and you'll never know the thing that you saved uh, here, but you'll, it'll be the problem that you never had that you're so happy you never had. Riding the razor's edge. All right, so what's next?